environment that was incredibly overwhelming with that much um, with that much kind of chaos going on around them and different communication styles from the other dogs that they're having a hard time adjusting to uh, regular life. They're very skittish. Um, they're have a little bit of leash. I don't want to say leash aggression, leash reactivity going on where they're reacting to seeing things in the environment like bikes um, and things like that. So we're working with some, a little bit of scent training and behavior modification for them, but it's, it can be intense for dogs to come into a world out of wherever they came from because that was their normal. Right. And it, it, it really sticks with me what you said about, um, I just really love the perspective. I think when, uh, when we first met, you described it like we teach people how to deal with their dogs. <laughs> it was yes. so it was something like that because you hear you hear the dog's pace and you automatically think oh it's you know it's a dog training school you know things like that and then when you when you said really we we train people to deal with their dogs i just really and to understand them right because absolutely they're not human even though right. we personify them to the you know days as long as the day is we personify dogs and and assume that they since they live in a human world they process things in a human way and they just don't. Um, and, you know, part of what I think, I mean, I'm an addict, I'm a dog addict. <laughs> uh, part, of the, part of the reason that I think they're so powerful in our human world is because exactly, they are not human. And the, the um, talents that they have, you know, the, the soothing nature that a dog can bring to somebody who is having a panic attack, for example, or, you know, those are things that are inherently dog. The fact that, you know, dogs don't lie. They don't have that capacity to do that. I just, it's just, you know, we should all be a little more dog. I, I have to own up here just for a second because this is, this is my first time doing, you know, Facebook Live slash Zoom. And it was only a couple of minutes ago that I hit the record button. So I saw that. It's happened to me too. <laughs> So, well, live and learn and get better every day. Sorry. Right. It'll be on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, tell us a little bit about Michelle. How did you end up in this career with this business? Uh, so, I, <laughs> um, I grew up when I was a kid. I was terrified of dogs. And there's something that happens when we're inherently afraid of something that sometimes it, it sparks a little bit of interest. You know, we get a closer look at that spider. We It intrigues you. Yeah, it's just a little bit of, so growing up, I, I read everything I could read. Um, I got bit when I was a kid, so it was a quick introduction to what dogs are capable of, unfortunately. Um, I have been working with dogs since... I guess I formally started working with dogs in 2004. Um, and, you know, very part-time. I had a regular day job. I was director of HR for a post-secondary school. Um, I, you know, I call it my real job because it was <laughs> in the office every day, sit in front of a computer, deal with paperwork and everything. Realized very quickly that it was not what was gonna make me happy and had the fortune to kind of fall out of that and into a management job at a grooming salon. I did not know how to groom at the time. I was completely new, uh, but I knew business and took that salon up and away, realized that I learned how to groom, became very good, went to competitions, all of that stuff, and realized very quickly that that was not a career that was going to be, have longevity for me. Um, right. I carpal tunnel really early, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and it, it it's hard to, it's hard, it was hard for me, it became hard for me to groom the dogs and still see the good in the dogs. Because in grooming, you're, you're in their face, you're, there's very little room for training and kind of compassionate um, care. Because that takes a long time to build trust with the dog and right. see them every two months or so. It, 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 there's too much of a gap. So I started a, um, 
positive based grooming company that emphasized that, that you would come in and see me every week. We would work on a little, <clears throat> would build the trust with the dog. And these are for problem clients, the dogs who got overly aroused when they were, you know, forced with something they didn't want to do. It sounds similar to when you have a child who, and, and children thrive on continuity mm -hmm. and yeah, familiarity. And so I don't have kids, but from the people that I know who have children and who've come through my training program, there are a lot of similarities between, um, my neighbor is a, is a special ed teacher and we talk all the time about behavior modification and it's very similar. <laughs> there um, you go. It's, it's interesting. Um, but I, I started teaching scent work in 2009, um, got into it full time. I independent contracted all over the state um, and started teaching outside of states. So I teach all over the country now. Um, you know, Oregon, North Carolina is a big spot for me. Um, Colorado, Texas, kind of all over the place. I go do workshops and seminars um, and decided that I wanted a little more control over my home classes. I didn't want to be at the kind of the mercy of whatever the training center was doing with my program. Mm -hmm. I wanted control over that. So I opened the dog's pace and our whole premise is that we work with the dog that you have. So we're not interested in, you know, everybody kind of keeping up with each other. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if my dog's picking up a topic or a concept a little bit more slowly than your dog. It's all, it, it doesn't do any good from a training perspective to push when the concepts aren't solidified yet. So that's where our, that's really where the, um, the idea for the dog's pace came from. And that is our complete focus in whatever we're doing, whether it be behavior modification or um, the scent work. Sounds like it's very individualized. Yes, even in our group classes, it's very individualized. And there's a culture of community when you do that, which is, is fun to see, you know, the humans kind of bond together and support one another. That's great. Okay, let's go, let's go back. Now, when you were younger, how old were you when you got your first job? And what was that job? My first job? Yeah. Oh, it had to be, aside from like babysitting and side jobs and, and like that that you do when you're, you know, I think I started babysitting when I was 12. Cause Me too. It's okay <laughs> to do that now. I guess it's not. I don't know. I don't have, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think, uh, aside from those jobs, I think my first like real paycheck job was uh, I worked for Disneyland. Wow. In oh, Southern wow. California. That's right. So um, I, I worked at Disneyland um, serving drinks. So that, that was my first job and then the typical like waiting tables and things like that. So nothing that extravagant, but it was cool to work at Disney. I, I can only imagine <laughs> lots of stories, lots of stories from the times of Disney. And it was always surprising to me how, how grumpy people could be at the greatest place on earth, the happiest place on earth. Like I, I, it was always fascinating to me, but you have, you know, parents with kids that are excited and running around and they're trying to wrangle them. And is half of my job is trying to make sure everybody was okay. <laughs> I, I can imagine. Wow. Yeah. yeah that, a little uh, bit of stress at the happiest place on earth. I don't know. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what about your family? Do you have uh, siblings? I have, a, I have a younger sister. Uh, she lives in LA now. Um, she's a doctor of physical therapy. She's the, uh, the smart one in the family. <laughs> um, I'm, the, I'm the free spirit, the entrepreneur. <laughs> the, the, it's more straight laced. Um, but she, we get along really well. We're very close. Um, my family, my parents still live in Orange County, so I'm the only one that's on the East Coast right now. I mean, but at least when things are, uh, before this situation happened, you, you traveled on a weekly basis, right? Yeah. Not yeah. necessarily always to California, but... Uh, <laughs> 
No, uh, but I always tried to make a stop. So if I was yeah. on the West Coast, then I would, like I went to Oregon um, uh, in fall, I think, and hopped a flight down to LA to visit for a, a day or two. But at that point, the flight from Oregon to LA is not long. Right. So if I spent the six hours on a plane to get to the West Coast, then I just, I stay a little bit longer. I, I try to capitalize on wherever I go. There was a period of time where I was just, my travel schedule was so straight out that I would go right from one work location to another. And not really, it, it occurred to me that I was traveling the country, but never actually seeing the country. So I started kind of spending a little more time. Like I went to work in Montana and took like, three days after my work to explore, you know, Yellowstone and all the things that are, uh, they drop. Wow. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. There, there are some remarkable caves in Missouri. Wouldn't exactly think that anything was in Missouri, but there are caves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find a cool thing to do in every place that I go. <laughs> Carolina a lot. I haven't really explored it yet though. So I'm looking forward to that when we can, when it's cool to travel again. Right. <laughs> Never, whenever that is. I'm not in a hurry to get on a plane anytime soon. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. I, I think a lot of us feel that way. What do you exploring, exploring all the online options is definitely where it's at right now. Absolutely. So Aside from what's going on, what do you usually do for fun? You know, people always ask me this question and I, I, <laughs> I always struggle with an answer because my regular life is so fun to me. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like work. I mean, you know, there's a little bit of burnout sometimes, you know, like I am reluctant to train my own dog from time to time if I've had a big work day because you're just kind of tapped. Right. Um, all in all, my regular life is so much fun. So, I mean, I do a lot with my dog, you know, uh, in the summertime we go kayaking. I was just talking to a friend about trying to convince him this is not going to go well. I should video it because it's going to be funny. Um, but trying to convince him that he wants to ride on my paddleboard. <laughs> He's 75 pounds of muscle. And if he were to, if he lays down on the board, I think that there's promise there, but there's no guarantee that he's going to stay like that. So we tend to stick to the kayak when he comes. <laughs> he's a big water dog. So we spend a lot of time on the water in the summer. Honestly, I had a feeling that's what you were going to say. So, <laughs> so hiking, although ticks are so bad that it's just, it's not fun. And, you know, I went to North, uh, New Hampshire last year and picked no word of life 40 ticks off of between him and me. It was, oh my goodness. And no tick stuff was, he's on ticks. It, it didn't matter. They were awful. They're not that bad down here, but they're bad. That's a job in itself. Yeah, oh, it was gross. It was just gross. Life with dogs is not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not glamorous. <laughs> not glamorous. <laughs> soon, um, we're getting a puppy soon, so. No way. Yeah, that'll take off a lot of time, I think. Yeah. I haven't had a puppy in, he's seven, so seven years. That's going to be exciting to see the dynamic between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, it always is. And, you know, introducing them kind of slowly. And he's really good with puppies, so I have that going for me. But there's still a process to make sure that dynamics are going to work correctly. Would he be willing to stand up so we can meet him? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen pictures of him. There he is. Oh, hi, buddy. What's his name? Chaser. Chaser. <laughs> yeah, he was just napping. <laughs> he interrupted. Sorry, Chaser. <laughs> okay. What, um, what are you afraid of? 
heights. You're not going to see me skydiving anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel that way too. <laughs> nope. Nope. There's some, um, I hiked Grand Canyon not long ago and there were some of those passes that were like, whoa, not gonna, not gonna look down there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. When, uh, here's a tough one. When was the last time you failed? It, to, for me, it was today. <laughs> I think press and record like five minutes into our talk. <laughs> so I do online classes and they're recorded for people to watch after. And I can't tell you how many times I had to reteach the class with just myself because I forgot to record it during the. <laughs> um, God. I mean, probably a little bit. Oh, uh, I was working with Chaser outside and uh, we're learning agility, which is new for us. Neither one of us have ever done it before. And we're working on my sending him out to go over a jump. And he just wasn't, nope, did. He'd go out halfway, turn around and look at me. About halfway, turn around and look at me. And I realized after I made some adjustments in what I was doing that I was not, it was all me. It was, I was not communicating correctly. And he was just kind of failure after failure after failure, but it was my failure because I wasn't, he was doing exactly what I told him to do and I couldn't get my act together <laughs> to make it happen. But a few adjustments and we fixed it. I was going to say, in your defense, you said it was brand new, right? It is brand new, which means that I, I'm just playing around with some training concepts. Yeah. So I can get them to do the things. Um, and my concept today did not work. <laughs> well, I think a learning curve there. Yeah, definitely. Like the recording of the video. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Who are, who are your mentors? Um, so there is a very talented trainer. Um, she lives in, where does she live? Oakland, I think. She lives Northern California. And uh, she has a whole online training school that is a remarkable resource for positive trainers. I am all positive, so I don't use shop collars or prong collars or anything like that. Um, and she's built this entire community around this concept of positive training and has grown it to be quite um, influential. There are still a lot of trainers who do not subscribe to the current ideas about behavior modification, but kind of she has done an amazing job at cultivating this community uh, that the tides are kind of shifting a little bit and modern science is coming and, and catching up and people are, are really looking at that as the next kind of way to do things. And uh, so she's, because of what she's done and what she's built, I think that she's definitely somebody that I look up to. There's another local trainer um, who works right down the street actually at a different training center uh, who's along those same lines, uh, smaller scale, because she's, um, she's not national, but smaller scale. Um, and she's helped me kind of really think about my training philosophy and, and different training models and how dogs learn um, and, definitely one of my, one of the people where if I'm stuck with a problem, she's the one that I'll reach out to, to um, come up with the answer. That's really fabulous that you can, that you have that rapport like that, that you can sort of collaborate, even though you're doing basically this similar things. Uh, yeah. And, and I think the training community is really great like that. Um, outsiders who don't want to share information but on a whole it's it's in the dog's best interest for us to share different pieces of information that we've discovered along the way or different things that we've learned or realizations we've made um, there are a number of really great blogs out there where people are freely sharing information and you know my my idea is that that information should be available you know we should be collaborating on different uh, training concepts Agreed. Life and business go, like, it does, really. Life and business go so much better when you collaborate instead of 
compete. Yes, I agree. What advice would you give to a younger version of yourself knowing what you know now? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> just do it. Don't, don't stress it. Have a way of, especially when you have passion and, you know, enthusiasm for what you do, things have a way. I don't want to say working out because that, I feel like that's a little cliched, but things have a way of flushing themselves out to really give you some clear ideas. Um, you know, I stressed a lot about opening my own training school. I was determined for a long time that I didn't want a brick and mortar building because I liked the freedom that being an independent contractor gave me. Uh, but I, my, tra my personal training has come so much further now that I have my own space and have the freedom to try different training ideas, different class models, uh, right. different things like that. And I think the program <laughs> built there is quite significantly better than the program that I was building as an independent contractor. Nice. That's really awesome. Because one of the, one of the questions that I frequently ask, um, and I didn't ask you because I already know the answer. It's, are you a risk taker? And I know you are. I think you have to be. I, I, I think, I, yeah. you know, with an entrepreneurial spirit, I think that goes hand in hand with, um, jumping. Agreed. Yep. Or without a, a parachute. <laughs> Just going for it. That doesn't mean we don't agonize about it along the way. That there's a cartoon um, that is one of my favorite depictions of owning your own business. And it's this constant up and down of, you know, an emotional roller coaster where I'm doing great. Why was I so worried about this? And then pandemic happens. And then, oh, no, I got it. I, I'm, I, I organized everything. I'm, I'm on the upswing. Why was I so worried? And then, you know, landlord, you lose your lease because they decide to open a marijuana growing facility, which is me. <laughs> That's a good segue into my next question. What keeps you up at night? It's a very general answer, but complete and utter failure. Like one day, all of my, it's completely an unrealistic. It's, I, I, this is so unrealistic, but those are the things that keep me up at night. Um, is my students all of a sudden decide that I'm not as skilled as they thought I was and it's complete mutiny and they all to leave all at once and then I'm left with this building and nobody to come and have fun with their dogs with me but completely unrealistic I have a very good rapport with my students but those are the things that you know I have to talk myself down and remind myself nope we're we're good we're good we're dealing with pandemic we're coming out the other end it'll be it'll be good we've it's, it's and in our, our talents, right? Like this online interview, where it's pushing us to really try different ideas and see if we can work with the new, new formats of learning. Yeah, most definitely. Couple more questions and that way we can, I think we wanna try to keep it around 30 minutes. And again, I forgot to set the timer, but I'm looking <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the best we can. Um, okay. So when was the worst day of your professional career? And then how did you keep going after that? I, I don't know. I don't know that I have an answer to that question. I, I, okay, let me, let me flip. Every, so every time something bad has happened, I go immediately into what's going to happen next. So I've never gotten um, kind of beat down by anything in the professional world. Certainly this pandemic thing got me down for 
a little while just trying to consider how are we going to stay afloat without having real in life classes. Um, but that very quickly turned into well we'll come up with an online format and we'll work it through and we'll see if if that works for what we're doing. And I, ha I have to say that I love it. I, I think online classes are amazing. That's, that's awesome. You just roll with the punches, move on and evolve. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a waste of energy otherwise. I, I agree. Honestly, life's too short to dwell on that stuff. I agree. Okay, last personal question. And then I want to ask you a few more questions about the dog's pace. Um, what's one thing about Michelle that we would be surprised to find out? And, you know, I, I will throw it out there with, you know, putting, putting myself out there. One thing most people are surprised to know about me is that I really love heavy metal music. <laughs> yes, that, you're right. That is, that is awesome. That is awesome. Um, I don't know that it's that big of a surprise, but I am a trained artist. So I went to school for seven years to become a classically trained artist. So I um, have- You mean like painting? Mm -hmm. Wow. But, um, oil painting was always my um, forte. I don't have the time because I'm so invested in, in what I do for work now and him um, that, that uh, I switched to acrylic paints. I've been playing around with watercolor since we've been home so much more and I have so much more free time I'm not going to the school physically. So I've been playing with watercolor, sketching. Awesome. I just want to know how unusual that is given my personality. I, I think that it's a pretty easy leap to say, oh yeah, she's, she's a free spirited artist and <laughs> I just want to take a quick second and uh, say hey to uh, Chris and Jenny who are watching. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Uh, and okay, so how, you know, sort of in a nutshell, how has this pandemic changed your life and your business? How has it been affected and, uh, you know, how is it sort of evolving? And you've answered some of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the majority of my clientele, I, I am, a, for the most part, we do behavior work, but I am a competitive dog school and um, am most of my personal clients come from these uh people who want to do really well at their sport. Again, the scent work thing is a competitive thing, or it can be a competitive thing if you want to take it that far, and they've become incredibly addicted to it. So without classes, everybody was having a little moment of, oh my gosh, all my skills are going to deteriorate, and I'm not going to be as good when competitions start back up again. We're going to really fail. So there was a huge push to do something for them. So we started these online classes where, um, you know, there's two formats, either Zoom like this, and I will tell you how to, the exercise that I want you to do, and you'll do it with your dog, and I'll coach via, uh, via video. Or, which is even cooler in my opinion, we do these massive video reviews where people video their work with the dog and their searches, and then we pull it apart and talk about handling strategies and leash work and intricacies, oh, wow. which is, you know, that's the really com uh, complicated stuff to teach a person because by the time I get the words out about how to adjust the leash or what to do differently or how they could better help their dog, uh, the moment has passed. And there's something, you know, again, I train people, so there's something to be said about marking the exact moment. It's just like, just like dogs. <laughs> something to be said about marking that exact moment that the thing happens and it creates a connection for the, for the human so they can better execute it the next time. And I'm seeing tremendous learning from my competitive students in that way. The other thing that's cool for behavior work is I'm getting to train these dogs in their familiar setting, which we never get to do. 
there's not a, you know, I would do house calls and I'm a stranger in the house. So that changes the way the dog acts about stuff. Um, the coolest part is that they, they're, they're completely comfortable. So the learning for the animal of what their humans are doing, again, I train the humans, the humans do the work with the dog. Um, the learning for the animal is so much greater. It's, it's really cool. And, and not some, I'm hoping that it's something that people can grab onto and do more of um, because that is really powerful for behavior modification. It's a really good point too. It, it sort of reminds me of what coaches do in sports. You know, they record, they record practice, they record their games and they, they pull them apart and break up the plays and what, what could we have done better? Uh, that's, that's a good word for it. You know, for my competitive students, I am the coach. I am, you know, yeah, we train the dogs and we build their skills and stuff, but I'm teaching them how to better interact with their dog in those moments where they're searching. And I just, I just absolutely love, you know, how you say, because it's the dog's pace, but I train people. <laughs> I love that. Maybe I should rename the school the human space because we all <laughs> the human speed. <laughs> okay, uh, last question. So what do you see for the future of the dog's pace? How do you see the, the training evolving uh, long term after this pandemic? Yeah, so our, our our training evolves constantly because training is not a stagnant thing, something that continues to evolve, you know, as the dogs grow skills, as the humans grow skills, um, we have to keep kind of altering and realizing that not one format fits all dogs or all humans. There are different things that we have to take into consideration. So I think continuing on that thread, um, before pandemic, actually right before pandemic, there was a consideration to open a second location down on the Cape. Um, but that is not, we're, we're postponing all of that kind of, uh, forward, that sort of forward thinking we're postponing and really focusing on this online forum. Um, we're revamping our website a little bit to create a class forum that is not Facebook based, that is kind of of its, in its own category to get people to feel a little more comfortable sharing stuff. Um, so that's really the new, the new push is to create some integrated classes where we can have a little online learning and a little in-person learning. And somehow, I haven't exactly decided how yet, I want to bring those two things together and create a better, even a, even a better learning environment for both human and dog. And you can, if you do with the online trainings, you're really, you're not at all limited to your local area. So that's just really literally opens up the world to you. Yeah, we um, have students from all over the country in our online classes now, and it's great. It's, it's places that I haven't been able to get to yet physically. And there's something to be said. You know, when I go out and do a workshop, I have, I have the dog and the client for, I mean, maybe it's a six-hour workshop. So I have the dog and the clients for that long. But after I've left, there's no clarification of ideas or work that you know, we would normally do in, in classes that I have here. So the cool part about these remote students that are doing it online is they have me every week to continuously, you know, not reinvent the training ideas, but alter them a little bit per what the dog is doing. Right, right. Vary them according to the dog's ability and, right. and the need and everything. Yeah, sounds great. Well, it, I just want to say, Thank you again. So oh, thank you for, for having this. This was so awesome. Just, just a little plug here at the end. So Michelle and I are members of a networking group together. We're members of the NGU organization, which is Networking Group USA. Uh, we, uh, we started a chapter near, near my office and just want to give a little plug for NGU. If you guys like networking, uh, it's a really great organization. And I want to say thanks again to Michelle Ellertson from the Dog's Pace in Franklin, Mass. Really awesome business. It's called the Dog's Pace, but she teaches people. 
how to deal with their dogs. And um, so this is, I'm gonna write a little article, put this in my newsletter. Um, and if anybody wants to be on the mailing list, you know, shoot me a message, let me know. Thanks for being here today. And I'll be posting this on my YouTube channel. Um, Michelle uh, will be posting it. And uh, so this video will be around so you can learn more about the dog's pace. So thanks again, Michelle. This was really Thank you so fun. much, Julie. <laughs> this was really fun. And yeah. have a great day, everybody.